by Brandon Villers of ZD Winery. And welcome, Brandon. Well, thank you. Good to be here. You're, and so great to have you. Um, I want to give you a little bit of an introduction to ZD Winery and Brandon Villers because this winery is near and dear to my heart. I think I visited them almost 40 years ago. If it's possible, I'm even old enough to have had that experience. That's a miracle unto itself. But like his father and grandfather before him, Brandon was always aware that he wanted to be a winemaker. And he started working in ZD's cellar at the ripe old age of 11. So Brandon was one of the first graduates from the wine and viticulture program at Cal Poly in San Luis Obispo and continued his education in the California Central Coast, working in vineyard management for Pacific Vineyard Company and in production at Everly Winery. He started working full time for ZD 17 years ago and received his wine intensive EMBA from Sonoma State in 2015. He's committed to pr producing the highest quality of wines and furthering ZD's um, ecological efforts, which I absolutely love. Always looking for new and innovative approaches to winemaking. You are the winemaker at ZD Winery. Welcome, Brandon. So that's a pretty amazing career you, you have already. And um, starting at 11 and, and working for 17 years, that puts you just under 30. Is that accurate? Um, 30 years of working or 30 years old? Thir uh, 30 <laughs> years old. <laughs> 40. I just, I just turned 40. <clears throat> oh, well, you're a very young looking 40. So I appreciate that. I don't feel <laughs> that way. <laughs> well, with a newborn, you know, that definitely changes the map of things. So um, an EMBA, what is exactly is an EMBA? Um, they put E in the front just for executive. Um, so they call it a wine intensive executive MBA. Sonoma State's been doing it for a few years now. I was in the second cohort. Um, it was a great experience, and basically it's kind of like an MBA, but instead of um, professors doing it, it's more industry people. Um, oh, so it was a really God. great experience for me. Yeah, especially for me, you know, all my education and really work experience going up into that was production stuff. And so that okay. was kind of my first taste of the business side, you could say. Which is a very giant animal to contend with. So I definitely have a huge appreciation for that. Tell me a little bit about um, the background of ZD Winery. Okay. Um, so if, if it were my uncle here, th th this would be the 30 minute talk in itself, but I'll try to keep it short. <laughs> okay. um, so my grandpa uh, founded the winery in 1969. So about 55 years ago um, with his buddy, uh, Gino Zapponi. This was the time of the space race. They were aerospace engineers working in Sacramento at Aerojet General, working at the fur, working to produce the first uh, rocket engine, right? Wow. Um, so that's kind of what ZD stands for. There's two things. One is the last names, uh, Zapponi and Delers. And then um, at the plant they're working at, there's uh, ZDs posted around. And that stands for zero defects. It's a moderately common engineering term, basically. Um, so they got together. They decided they wanted to start a business. So they decided on wine. Um, they had $3,000 a piece, which they bought a couple used barrels and some, at the time, broken down pumps um, and started ZD Wine. So for the first 10 years, um, all the money that uh, the money made was put back into the business. That's how it grew slowly until 1979. That's when my grandpa was able to finally purchase this uh, little parcel that we're on in Rutherford. Um, so then that was the first time when ZD had a full-time employee. So my grandpa was the first <laughs> full-time employee of ZD. Wow. Yep. And then um, soon after he hired my dad as the second uh, full-time employee, um, very soon after uh, promoted my dad to winemaker when my dad was exceptionally young. He was the youngest winemaker in Napa Valley at that time. Um, at that time, also, my grandma Rosalie was the entire sales team from day one 
<laughs> up until then. And so then shortly after that, my uncle Brett graduated from college and he came back, helped my grandma on the sales side. Um, let's see. And then I guess in terms of family stuff, I came on, you know, I started working when I was a little kid and was totally focused on it, you know, kind of like my dad was on the production side. Uh, we brought on my little sister. She, she grew up with it also like I did. Um, after she came back from school, she took care of West Coast distribution for many years until she went into uh, baby production. Um, and then we were <laughs> able to basically steal... Um, her husband, one of my very good friends, who ha happens to be sitting right next to me, um, ah, Scott Belici, from okay. a neighboring winery, and we and she basically trained him into her position. So he's now been running uh, West Coast distribution sales since then. Um, and also and does some tech support as well, right? Oh yeah. Well, you know. <laughs> yes, I do. Task, you know. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, yeah, but he's very good at that. Thank goodness. Yeah. Now, from the standpoint of ZD, as a, I mean, I'm a huge uh, fan of family owned wineries because I know that the name is on the line, the history is on the line, um, and the artisanal aspects are still super important to most family wineries, even when they grow large. What are ZD's specialties in wine? Yes. Um, yeah. So wine. Good, good question. So um, when we started out, so I mentioned that we started out with like $6,000, right? So we yes. definitely did not come from land ownership, like a lot of our uh, neighbors, right? So our focus in the very beginning was purely to make the best wine we can, not to express a certain site. Um, so we were very experimental um, from day one on where we were pulling fruit from and what varieties and just trying to make the best wine we could. So we kind of fell onto varieties and AVAs just based on wine quality. Um, so our specialties, number one is Chardonnay. Um, it's about half our production. Um, it comes from Napa, Sonoma, um, Monterey and Santa Barbara. So the four kind of major coastal coastal regions. Um, number two would be Pinot Noir. So we started with Pinot Noir in 1969. Yeah, there it is. Um, there it is. One of the cool things we can say is that uh, we were the first winery to put Carneros onto a wine label. And that was with Pinot. So we've been doing Carneros Pinot for quite some time. And doing it quite well, I might add. That is one of my absolute favorite things that you folks produce. It's just phenomenal Pinot Noir. Thank you. Appreciate it. <laughs> um, Cabernet. So Cabernet, we kind of fell into Cabernet. We tried it prior when we were in Sonoma, but we moved from um, Sonoma, from a small rented farm building to Napa in 79. So that's when we brought on Cabernet. Uh, for real, and we're focused completely on Napa for Cabernet. Um, we have two small products that are named after my grandma, so the Rosalie um, one, and those are taste room only wines, so a Pinot Noir Rosé and a Petit Verdot, and that's that's basically it. Oh, huh. and we brought on Sauvignon Blanc. So I've been pushing for Sauvignon Blanc for many years, <laughs> and uh, my uncle Brett gave me the green light to actually bring it on in 2019. So that's our newest. Uh, wine that we're actually sending into distribution. So we haven't done that in a long time. Exciting. That's very exciting. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Let's talk sustainability because sustainability is becoming more and more of a conversation. We're also hearing, um, you know, different aspects of sustainability. There's a few different schools of thought. Everybody's doing it differently, but um, you guys are really on the cutting edge, almost the bleeding edge of sustainability in Napa Valley. Can you tell us a little bit about what you do um, in the sustainable realm and also what challenges you were facing that kind of triggered that response? Yeah, so um, challenges. So, you know, for the, on the sustainability front, 
Um, what we do started long before I was born, you know? And so as a real simple aspect, like, you know, the more you learn about it, the more you want to do it. And it's a continual, continual thing that doesn't really end, right? Right. Um, our biggest challenge um, in my mind, so with our 50th anniversary in 2018, we used that moment as kind of drawing the line in the sand where we started farming organically um, in the early 80s here. Okay. Um, and then once we got comfortable that feeling like we know how to do this, then we started asking our growers to farm our blocks organically. And we get a lot more fruit from our growers than we do from ourselves. Um, and so by the time our 50th hit, that we'd basically gotten all of our growers to convert all of our blocks to certified organic. Um, That's beautiful. It's a very, very sweet moment. Um, took a lot yeah. of work, you can imagine. <laughs> oh, um, yeah. so, so now in terms of a challenge, it's like, you know, this is like a pillar of our company. And so uh, finding new people to continue to grow and certify their vineyards we won't work with fruit that's not certified organic so that has now essentially become a challenge to try to get more growers to certify their their, their vineyards for us understood and mm -hmm. it's got to affect the price a little bit too right i mean because people uh, people want yeah. beautifully made wine without all of the things that come along with non-organic wine right um Short answer, no. Um, we, oh. price, <laughs> we price <laughs> the wine um, strictly based on quality. Um, we do pay more um, to our growers for the additional effort mm -hmm. um, and for the care they're putting into their vineyards. But uh, no, we do not charge more for the organic. You know, honestly, like, so our wine's not organic, right? Organic wine would be no no added sulfites. We're not right. going to that level. Um, we don't want. We want to have um, wines that will age in the bottle for a very long time. Um, it's tricky. Um, it's kind of a niche market having something that's on the wine shelf that is organic, organic, and so we're not trying to push ourselves into that niche in terms of the marketing side so much. Um, so when you look at our our bottle, there's nothing organic on the front. There's no CCOF on the back. We just do a real minimal ingredient statement that says that the wine was made with organic grapes. I love that though, because who else is doing that? Who else is like literally putting organic grapes 100% in all of their bottles? That is also making super sustainable wine. Not a lot of that's people. A very, that's a very good question, Kelly. It's a, it's a very <laughs> small. It's a very small margin, and I, I would be remiss very if I small. didn't mention that you folks are certified sustainable by Napa Green. Um, Napa Green, for those of you who might not know, is probably one of the most rigorous uh, certification, third-party certification organizations in the country, um, and the only one that I've honestly found that is more rigorous is New Zealand wine growers, which they mandate that everybody be certified sustainable in their country. So, um, so kudos to you guys on that. Um, let's talk a little bit about recognizing that change needed to be implemented in order to be more sustainable. Was that triggered by the old guard or more by you and, um, your, your, um, your siblings. Nope, I can claim nothing on that. Totally the old guard. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, kind of a fun little story. Um, so, you know, we didn't own any land for the first 10 years, right? Then we get this little piece. It's like, all right, let's try some farm. Obviously we're, we're in Rutherford, so it's gonna be Cabernet. So we plant some grapes. Um, we don't have a tractor. So, all right, we, let's get a, someone out here that has a tractor that's done some farming before to help us, right? Okay. And so then, of course, you have to run into little issues, right? So the first issue we run into is leafhopper, 
which is a very common little guy that jumps around mm. and kind of sucks on leaves and just reduces photosynthesis a little bit, but very common, not a big deal. So without our knowledge, he went out and sprayed for it. Killed, killed the bug, right? Right. And then my, and then my grandpa finds out what the re-entry period is uh, based on the toxicity of the material that was used, right? So you can't go back in the vineyard for days. So that was when my grandpa's like, all right, a mistake was made here. Um, that's not going to happen again. And from basically from that moment forward, we were organic farmers. Wow. In the beginning, it was just, you know, in the beginning, it's like you don't add the, um, the synthetic materials that are sometimes toxic. Um, and then after years of, you know, when I was going into, when I was in high school, I was going to economic farming conferences and stuff like that, right? So I was kind of indoctrinated. But for us as a company, um, as you learn more, you get better at it, right? So then we, instead of just not, um, not incorporating the things that uh, are negative, you start to incorporate things that are beneficial and try to build your soils and build the biodiversity and all the things that we're, you know, we get better at over time. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now you have a lot of technological things that are happening out in the vineyard today that are kind of next level. Do you want to talk for a moment just about the solar panels and the electric vehicles that you're using? Sure. Yeah. So um, wineries use a lot of energy. Um, you know, we have, you know, big tools to process grapes, but uh, more than that, you know, fermentation creates a lot of heat. And so it requires a lot of cooling um, is our biggest kind of energy suck. Um, so being that we use so much energy, it makes a huge amount of sense for wineries to produce their own energy, especially in a clean way. So 14 years ago, we were one of the first wineries to put in a really big um, solar array. Um, at the time, it um, covered all of our energy use. Um, and then over time, we start introducing more electric stuff like the vehicles and converting, you know, water heaters over to electric and, you know, forklifts and trying to make everything that we Clean. can electric. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's a no brainer. I mean, the, the original array we put in had a seven year uh, break even period in terms of cost. Mm -hmm. We're now 14 years. Right. And so wow. right now we're actually looking at kind of doing it again. And it's still the exact same thing where it'd be a seven year break even. And these panels should last for 25 years. And so it's not really so much, you know, I look at, you know, wineries should be a long term have a long-term view, right? right? It's like everybody, everybody should be doing this. I don't know why it, why people aren't, you know, it's, yes. just, it's just good business sense. Right? It's good business. It's good for the planet. It's good for children's futures. It's yeah, it's a no brainer. All the way around. And the cars are really fun to drive too. <laughs> <laughs> now that might be my next, <laughs> my next visit. I might have to drive something with you. I'm kidding. Okay. Yes. What kinds of things did you implement to save water? Because water is a huge issue in California, even though we've had a ton of rain recently, it, it just never is one of those things that's always fixed. Yeah. Yeah. Water's like energy where wineries use an insane amount. Um, like when you go and apply to the county for a new permit, um, what their formula is, is that a winery to produce one gallon of wine Utilize it uses five gallons of water to make a gallon of wine inside wow. the winery. Um, we use less than one gallon of water to make a gallon of wine. That's um, awesome. So, I mean, we do, we're pretty good. Um, I'm not, I, I honestly don't know if that's great or not, but we certainly do our best. <laughs> it sounds great um, to me. Uh, so, the easy ones are appliances, right? Low water use appliances. Um, when you're in the cellar, when you wash barrels, which we yeah. do a lot of, because all of our wines are barrel aged, um, you pay attention and you don't just wash every barrel for three minutes. 
when there's clean water coming out of the barrel, you stop it at one minute and 30 seconds or whatever it is. It's simple things like that. Um, you know, a big thing with water is processing it. Um, all of our water that we use here, we basically send into a, a large series of underground tanks where we call it a, a biological digesting system, aerobic biological digesting system. And so, you know, we're sending a lot of nutrients down the drain because it's, you know, spent, you know, lees like wine yeast and stuff like that. And so we need to consume all those nutrients before it goes back onto the land and therefore would create problem like these algae blooms and all that stuff, right? We need, we need to have right. no um, BOD or biological oxygen demand or TSS, total soluble solids in that water before we send it back. So that's one thing we've learned over the years is we've slowly expanded and expanded our water processing system so that the water that we use when it goes back into our vineyard is essentially Clean. drink it. Yeah. Wow. So how, like, how, this may be too technical for, well, it may be too technical for me, <laughs> but how do you, so how do you filter it? Are you using like rocks and stones and sand and things like that through the f filtration system or is it? Right. They have systems like that where it's kind of like a pond and you trickle through roots of plants. Um, that stuff is cool. Ours is all under underground. So big oh. tanks big um, blowers, so creating lots of bubbles to okay. um, basically keep um, good bugs alive, the aerobic ones and not the anaerobic ones. And so they will they work on digesting all those nutrients that we put into the water. And then wow. the final step is, yeah, actually we will filter it, um, keep those solids behind. And then eventually about once a year, we'll truck off the solids. Okay. Genius. That's genius. No, no worries. Yeah. I was worried mine was going to go off. <laughs> okay. Let's talk about resources on reducing packaging because packaging is one of those things that I still cringe because yeah. I get wine sent to me with styrofoam and all this stuff that's plastic. It's never going to go away. Um, what, what was the approach in the packaging realm? There is no excuse for using styrofoam. Styrofoam yeah. is the worst. That's completely insane. Yeah. Um, I totally agree. <laughs> that's just bad. I'm um, with you on that. Bad business. Yeah. Packaging, packaging is tricky, um, especially when you're, you know, we're in the ultra premium, um, you know, spot in the wine category. Um, so we're not going to put wine in a bag. You know what I mean? Thank you. Yep. Um, <laughs> and so <laughs> we're going to use glass, but glass is recyclable. Um, the tin capsule is 100% recyclable, water-based inks, 100% uh, natural cork that goes in your compost bin. Um, the glass weight is a trick, honestly, um, yeah. because the ultra lightweight bottles to, when you pick it up, it conveys affordability. And so we try to kind of walk the walk the line where when you hold our bottle, it feels like it should in terms of an ultra quality wine. Right. It's not excessively heavy, you know? Absolutely, yes. Um, and so in terms of, um, it's about all the little extras, you know, like making sure that the web that holds your wine labels is recyclable material and having inside the winery, wherever you have a garbage can, you have a recycling and also a compost because with the Napa compost, composting facility now, any kind of soiled thing like um, a paper towel that you use in your hands, and we use a lot in the bathrooms here, all that stuff should be composted, composted, right? And so it's little things yeah. like that. Yeah. That's beautiful. Let's yeah. talk a little bit about the um, the wine because we're running out of time and I want to make sure the wine is so delicious and so outstanding. You want to talk about the Chardonnay? This is, uh, what's sure. the vintage on this? 2021 for the Chardonnay. Yeah. Yeah. So um, Chardonnay we've been producing basically from the very beginning. Um, 
we got really popular because of Chardonnay. Um, in the early days, we bottled multiple different Chardonnays from Napa, Sonoma, Monterey, and Santa Barbara. Um, those, wow. That's when my, when my grandpa was the winemaker. And then when my dad took over, um, he was very young and dumb. And he's like, hey, we should um, make a California Appalachian because we can make a higher quality and more consistent wine. Um, but that was kind of ballsy because California Appalachian, it's, you're competing with lower quality wines, honestly. There's no one right. in California Appalachian that would, at that time, maybe even now is like, you know, doing what we're doing. Um, but basically that created um, an awesome opportunity for us at, like on the production team to create a wine that was ultra consistent. Um, another thing that kind of makes us unique is we use American oak. Um, most nice. of our neighbors are using French oak. Um, we just love the kind of vanilla and coconut characters that it gives the wine. Um, we are very careful about not over oaking all of our wines. And so the amount of new oak that goes into the wines is um, quite low. Um, and then also we don't go through malolactic fermentation. So, um, you know, Napa is kind of known for like buttery Chardonnay. That right. butter character is made through malolactic fermentation where you know, your malic acid is converted to lactic acid through a bacterial secondary fermentation and creates that character. So we've always avoided that completely, um, leaving all the natural acids, which are brighter and you know, create so, our pure style. It's so fresh and beautiful, but it still has a little bit of body. It's not like, um, I mean, definitely you can tell it hasn't gone through mallow, but but it's really beautiful. It's one of the, it's a generous Chardonnay, but it's not, um, yeah, the buttery thing does not work for me <laughs> at all. So thank you for this yes. fresh, fresh and delicious, absolutely beautiful Chardonnay. What is the price point on this? I should know that. Um, $42. $42 worth every penny. Okay, let's jump into the Pinot Noir, my favorite, my personal cool. favorite. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah so yeah i'm happy i have these wines right here um Seriously. yeah uh let's see so yeah so pinot first wine we made right so my grandpa norman he loved loved pinot so started out with this um so because we liked the carneros appellation pinot so much we've just stuck with it just so it's just carneros um the fruit comes from both the Napa and Sonoma side of Carnero. So, you know, Carnero is a big aviate. It's the only one that goes to both Napa and Sonoma sides, right. which is awesome for us because both sides create great wines. Um, for us, Pinot Noir, you know, it's a gentle, it's like a, a wine you want to treat gently. And so it's very simple on the production side. Um, during primary fermentation, we'll punch it down by hand in our tanks four times a day to extract, you know, all the wonderful aromas and colors from the skin. Um, and then we'll go down a barrel for 10 months. And this is the only wine we use French oak with. Um, and then aside from that, it's kind of like all the little details that, you know, set apart good from great in terms of just really paying attention. Excellent. This is absolutely yeah. delicious. I'm going to cuddle up with this tonight. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Tell me a little bit about, because I had the opportunity to go to your tasting room, take in the magnificent views. What do you have, um, like what kind of experiences are you creating for people when they come to visit the winery? What can they do? That's a very good question um, for a salesperson. Um, <laughs> Sorry about that. Well, <laughs> <laughs> no, we, we renovated the winery um, just prior to our 50th anniversary. So we kind of use that as like, a, as like a time, like, let's make it really cool leading up to that. We also updated our website, you know, um, both of those things needed some updating. Um, so we have a beautiful deck that overlooks the valley looking um, to the west. Uh, we basically overlook, you know, um, kind of mom came in some Beckstoffer sort of um 
So that's wonderful. We also have different tours. Uh, one would be, you know, our highest level one is the Abacus tour. Uh, I forgot to mention Abacus actually when we, we have to went talk down the about list. Abacus. Yes. Yeah. Let's talk about That would about be a Abacus. huge fail. I would get fired if I didn't mention Abacus. Um, <laughs> so, so Abacus is pretty cool. It's totally unique. Um, so in a sentence, Abacus is, it's our pinnacle wine. Um, it is a multi-vintage blend of every reserve Cabernet that we've ever produced going back to 02. Wow. So right now it's a blend, it's a single bottle that has uh, 30 vintages of our reserve Cabernet in it. So like a cuvee of sorts, right? Right, yeah, That's yeah. So it's beautiful. done, exactly. Like, yeah, Champagne does some multi-vintage stuff, you know, Sherry. It's, it's played with here and there, but no one's taken it to the level that we have with Cabernet Sauvignon. Um, so it's really, um, really complex, really very cool wine. Um, so you could do that tour as, you know, the, the, the ultra high end. Absolutely. Um, oh, yeah. And, oh, my little sister. <clears throat> yes. I mentioned, I mentioned that she was, you know, our West Coast, you know, distribution person for, for years. Yes. Um, she's kind of coming out of retirement right now. And while uh -oh. she was away, she's been spending a lot of time in the kitchen, as women should. Um, but <laughs> um, she's a great, she's a great <laughs> chef now. And we just promoted her to ZD Chef. So it's really wow. cool. So she's back. Um, so That's she's fantastic. making the food pairings that are going up, you know, to our tasting room, which are spectacular. Um, and so that has really kind of upscaled us quite a bit right there. It's next level stuff. I mean, you take, you take the history that you folks have, the fact that you've remained consistent, the family winery, the organic aspects of farming, the sustainability piece, the extraordinary views that people can enjoy the wine, taste some pairings, and have a beautiful Napa Valley experience. You can't beat it. You literally can't beat it. Okay, so we That'd want everybody generous. to visit zbwines.com, the brand new website. What is your Instagram? Uh, at ZD Wines. At ZD Wines, and make sure and follow on YouTube at ZD Wines as well, right? Brandon, you have so. been absolutely amazing. <laughs> Will you come back? Oh, sure. Yeah. I'm, okay. I just do as I'm told. So yeah. <laughs> I, I like that. Okay. We're bringing yeah. you back. But um, let's, let's introduce, I think a, a, another day might be to introduce the Abacus wines in, <laughs> you know, the, the stellar format that they deserve. They, you could do an entire episode on those wines because they're absolutely wonderful. I yeah, so sure. appreciate you, your family and your sister and the wine you make so please keep up cool. the good work and um and i can't wait to to talk more yeah thank you Kel. it's an honor really appreciate likewise it. likewise yeah. take care all right cheers you too cheers bye bye, -bye.